This film employs dramatic reenactments. All words spoken by actors are exact quotations drawn from the interviews, journals, and memoirs of those who fought. North Korea, perhaps the saddest, most isolated place on earth. Every day in the capital, Pyongyang, citizens who have pleased the communist authorities are allowed to come and line up to see the tomb of the man called great leader, Kim Il-sung. He died in 1994, but is embalmed in the Constitution as President for Eternity. Kim Il-sung is venerated by the 1.1 million man North Korean army, the world's fourth largest fighting force, because he led them through a devastating war which nearly destroyed their country. kilometers to the south of Pyongyang, across a desolate no-man's land, the 600,000-man army of South Korea, under U.S. command, keeps a wary eye on the northern adversaries. There are also 37,000 American troops here, ready to be called to battle at a moment's notice. It is the most heavily armed standoff in the world the legacy of the biggest war ever fought between communism and capitalism. A war that has never technically ended. The Korean War. In 1950, when the communist North Korean army of Kim Il-sung attacked, the South Koreans and their American allies were caught by surprise. A thought flashed through my mind that this is the beginning of World War III. Here could well be the beginning of Armageddon, the last great battle between East and West. Young soldiers were called from all over the world to fight in Korea. I had to look at the map when I heard of Korea for the first time. Where the hell is it? <laughs> Chinese, the Yellow Sea? Where is that? For three years, the Korean peninsula became a slaughterhouse, killing thousands of French, British, Australians and Canadians. 36,000 Americans, 1 million Chinese, and three and a half million Koreans. The wounded arrive in endless streams. We operated on the urgent cases by tying them to the bed and knocking them out. This is a nightmare. This must be a nightmare. Over five decades later, there are still many mysteries about the Korean War. Why did the superpowers miscalculate so badly? How close did they come to nuclear war? Were chemical 
and biological bombs actually dropped on the battlefield. Ed and Myung Cook live in Nanaimo, British Columbia now. But here they walk another Pacific coast. It's called Malipo, Korean for long sandy beach. They have come back to Korea to remember a war that tore their families apart and scarred their youth. Today, South Korean Marines play soccer, not far from where fathers and grandfathers went through a blood war. The war broke out really all of a sudden. Uh, it was Sunday morning, as far as I remember. We were sleeping soundly, and the news broke out. Nobody was prepared. Oh, I see. When it started, Ed Cook was at boarding school. I was attending a secondary school in Taejeon. There was a big commotion, and there was a gathering of all students, and uh, I think it's a vice principal announced that war broke out. And there's no train, no bus, nothing, so you have to walk home. <laughs> we were told, so we started to walk home. <laughs> home to Malipo, 150 kilometers away. For a 12-year-old boy, the walk is an adventure, an adventure that becomes an ordeal. That summer was the longest, most terrifying summer for us. That was, I think, the month of July. Looking back, not many saw the signs of the big war shaping up on the Korean peninsula. It is one of the world's ancient civilizations but geography has always put Korea in peril. In the north, China and Russia, not always friends, and too near, Japan, Imperial Japan. When Japan conquered Korea in 1910, the Japanese military tried to erase Koreans as a people, banning their language and crushing all dissent. During the Second World War, Korean women by the thousands are made prostitutes for the Japanese army, the so-called comfort women. August 1945, the war ends. Japan surrenders to America and her allies, with General Douglas MacArthur accepting the capitulation. In the small fishing village of Malipo, Ed Cook remembers the exultation. One day I went to school and uh, the school teacher suddenly spoke in Korean <laughs> and he was even swearing I mean, in, a, in a joking way and using the words that I only heard home, never at school, and what's going on? And I, I felt some strain. Then he was on, on the organ, on the organ, and he was playing and singing in Korean and he was so happy. And we were told, go home and you burn all the Japanese books. <laughs> The U.S. Army arrives in the Korean capital and are greeted as liberators. But to the Koreans, what the United States does next is mystifying and upsetting. Instead of sweeping away the collaborationist regime, as they had done in Germany, the Americans keep the Japanese apparatus that has repressed Korea during the long occupation. Big power politics are at work. Unable to agree on a new government for all Korea, the U.S. and the Soviet Union split the country in two along the 38th parallel. The U.S. occupies South Korea. The Soviets occupy the North and look for a leader in their style. Kim Il-sung, a charismatic anti-Japanese guerrilla fighter, becomes a Soviet favorite and takes power in 1948. He is only 35 years old 
but his friendly, approachable image masks a ruthless political player who eliminates all potential rivals. He is a nationalist and determined to unite North and South Korea under his homegrown brand of communism. He promises to expel the Americans. <laughs> In South Korea, it is the United States that picks the government leader. 75-year-old Syngman Rhee is a Korean nationalist with a PhD from Princeton and strong ties to the American right. A fierce anti-communist, he vows to unite the two Koreas under his leadership. To lead the South Korean army, the U.S. chooses Che Pyongduk. He was a Korean in the hated Imperial Japanese Army. His nickname, Fat Che. Another Japanese collaborator, Chang Tek Sang, becomes the chief of the Seoul police. He is described as having the face of Nero and the manners of Goering. Even in Malipo, Japanese collaborators run the show. The Japanese system still remained there for a long time. And people trained under Japanese occupation still were those who run the government. For example, uh, uh, county office and uh, teachers and of course police and so on. They all were trained under Japanese uh, occupation. The uh, village people always feared of, uh, I mean, that police brutality, things like that, I mean, they, police were not friends at all. Soon the streets are filled with protest, and from a U.S. point of view, the communists are behind every demonstration, every strike, every cry for reform. In Seoul today, those protests are vividly recalled by Yu Chun Do, now a retired physician. In the lead up to the Korean War, she was a young, idealistic medical student wanting to reform a feudal system. <laughs> So the young medical student joins demonstrations against the Syngman Rhee regime. <laughs> Student and labor protests escalated, and soon there are armed uprisings against the Rhee regime. Under U.S. control, South Korean security forces strike back with a dirty war. A key figure in that war was U.S. Air Force Intelligence Colonel Donald Nichols, one of the few Americans to speak fluent Korean. He died in 1992, but left behind a detailed account of the barbarism he witnessed and often quietly orchestrated during the anti-communist campaign. I witnessed many executions of spies, saboteurs, guerrilla warfare personnel. The firing squads are composed of members of the South Korean army. The people to be executed are brought in by truck, unloaded, and then each one is tied to a wooden post. Pieces of paper with a black dot are pinned to every man or woman's chest to mark a target. The wooden coffins are brought up, placed beside each victim to be executed, and then, with no further ceremony, Orders begin. Ready. Aim. 
people to shot. And the remains are placed in the coffins. Our missions are always the same. Destroy the agitation. In 1948, Syngman Rhee wins an election in the South that many international observers say was fixed. Now he wants a war. He orders commando raids on North Korea and calls for a full-scale invasion of the North. Not wanting war, the United States denies Rhee the heavy weapons he needs for an invasion. In the North, Kim Il-sung matches Rhee speech for speech and raid for raid as an unofficial civil war escalates. Kim pressures his communist allies in the Soviet Union and China to back his plans for a full-scale invasion. Like the South, North Korea cannot go to war without help. China wants no part of a war. In 1950, Chinese leader Mao Zedong is rebuilding China after a long civil war. He shows little interest in Korea has not even sent an ambassador. In fact, he is still hoping for a rapprochement with the United States. Chinese historian and military veteran, Bin Yu. Actually, Mao and his uh, leading uh, colleagues signaled to the Americans that they wanted to have good relationship with the United States. This is the so-called missed opportunities. They sent cables, they approached American diplomats, even before communists uh, seized power in, but they were all dismissed. In Washington, in June of 1950, there are a few signs that the United States is about to get enmeshed in a terrible war in Asia. America is prosperous and at peace. U.S. President Harry Truman is being criticized for being soft on communism, and so the Truman administration is doing some tough talking outlining a list of countries the U.S. is willing to defend in a crisis. But Korea isn't on the list. Any war seems far away. It is the same story in Japan, at U.S. military headquarters in Asia, where Supreme Commander Douglas MacArthur expresses total confidence in America's unchallenged military might in the region. To the New York Times, the old militarist muses that perhaps war itself is becoming obsolete. The United Nations should look squarely at the problem of abolishing war. Yet the UN continually asks for its own armed forces. This is a ridiculous anachronism. Unfortunately, no one tells Soviet leader Joseph Stalin that war is obsolete. While the West pays little attention, Kim Il-sung comes to Moscow for a summit. His previous requests for heavy weapons have always been turned down. Now, he is allowed to buy those weapons. He is told he's also getting Soviet military advisors and a detailed plan for an invasion of South Korea. But Kim is warned that under no circumstances, if things go badly, will he get Soviet troops. In the weeks leading to war, the United States pays scant attention to danger signals coming from the 38th parallel border region. Villages on the communist side, report U.S. intelligence, are being evacuated. A sure sign that a major attack can be expected. Donald Nichols tries to raise the alarm. I made three different major reports in the 60 days before the fighting actually started. And some ass up at General MacArthur's headquarters in Tokyo didn't believe what was being reported. My last report said it would begin between the 25th and the 28th of June. I was not believed. Sunday morning, the 25th of June, 1950, 4 a.m. The North Korean army, strengthened by Soviet arms, including 100 of the top tanks in the Soviet arsenal, the T-34, storm across the 38th parallel. 
the civil war that both leaderships wanted has begun. From west to east, all along the parallel, South Korean forces are caught totally by surprise. Within hours, the northern forces are driving towards their first objective, the South Korean capital, Seoul. At his headquarters in Japan, American Supreme Commander MacArthur is awakened early in the morning with the urgent news. It brings flashbacks of World War II. I had an uncanny feeling of nightmare. It couldn't be, I told myself. Not again. I must be asleep and dreaming. leading war correspondents to report on Korea is Marguerite Higgins of the New York Herald Tribune. At the first news of the invasion, she rushes to witness the attack on Seoul. The road to Seoul is crowded with refugees. It's a moving and a rather terrifying experience to have crowds cheer and wave as our little caravan of Americans go by. Their obvious confidence in anything American has got a pathetic quality to it. I hope we don't let them down. At the United Nations, the U.S. presents a resolution condemning the North Korean attack and asking for a U.N. force to push them back. As may be necessary. The Soviet Union is boycotting the Security Council. And to restore With the Soviets absent, peace. the resolution sails through. This gross miscalculation means the communist bloc is now confronting most of the Western world. In Tokyo, General MacArthur accepts the first United Nations battle flag. General MacArthur is named the Supreme men, Commander the of all of United Nations Forces, nations which now come under total U.S. For control. freedom of peace-loving peoples everywhere. In Korea, communism has hurled its first challenge to war against the free world. It is as clear now as it will ever be that this is a battle against imperialistic communism. In the eyes of the West, Stalin and Mao are launching an imperial challenge. In reality, the two communist rivals are barely on speaking terms, with Stalin keeping Mao in the dark about details of the Korean plan. The Chinese leader is not even kept fully informed on war plans by the North Koreans. Two or three days after, the war broke out. I think the 27th or 28th, the North Korean government sent uh, a military, uh, a colonel or attaché to Beijing to inform the Chinese side what was going on. Uh, it was reported that the Chinese leaders like Mao and Zhou were not very happy with this. Now China hopes the war will end quickly so they won't have to get involved. On the battlefield, things are moving fast. Spearheaded by the powerful T-34 tanks, North Korean columns reach the outskirts of the South Korean capital in two days. South Korea has nothing capable of stopping the T-34s. At first, the South Koreans bravely tackled the tanks, highly inadequate 2.5 bazookas. They watched their volleys bounce off the monsters, and many squads, armed only with grenades and Molotov cocktails, went to suicidal deaths in frenzied efforts to stop the advance. At her medical school in Seoul, Yu Chun Do is suddenly practicing battlefield medicine. Uh, 
같은 소리가 들리고 막 굉장하게 들리기 시작했어요. 그래가지고는 대, 저, 난 학, 저 학생들이 밤에 그 폭탄을 피해가지고 숨었어요. 그 소설이 펴가지고. 서울 is divided by the Han River, spanned by a series of strategic bridges. Singman Ri records a radio broadcast reassuring the population, asking them to stay put and not flee across the river. But then he secretly flees across the bridge with his entourage. South Korean National Police, Seoul City Police, military and government officials ran like turpentine cats, leaving behind their posts, their responsibilities, and their families. After fleeing, the Sigmund Rhee military orders the bridges blown. This is catastrophic. Half of the South Korean army, 44,000 troops, are trapped on the enemy side. Most are forced to surrender and will never be seen again. The desperate early days of the war become a blur for Yu Chando, whose medical school is turned into a battlefield ward for first one army and then another. I go to the outpatient's room with my assignment slip. Yesterday's wounded South Korean soldiers are nowhere to be found. Jeeps carrying wounded soldiers arrive in the hospital yard. Some are carried in on stretchers, some hobble in leaning on others, and some hop in on one leg. The sight is the same as yesterday. The only difference is they have red stars on their caps and a stronger odor of sweat. When the North Korean communists move into Seoul, they begin hunting for class enemies among the population. So it was a just long uh, one-story house. Uh, Mi Young Cook has come back to her old neighborhood uh, in Seoul totally to remember the day her father was arrested by the communists and the because he was a banker. He was actually hiding in different houses. And the day that he came to our house to change clothes, uh, the people who were trying to uh, catch him were following him. So when he came out after changing his clothes, they came out and caught him. And I was uh, the perfect person to follow dad. My mom sent me to follow uh, him. So I was following them all the way down there. But I couldn't go all the way because it was at dusk and it was, it was getting dark, and uh, I didn't know how far I should go, you know, I should follow them. So I uh, followed as long as I could as, as an 11-year-old girl, and then my father said, uh, Dad said, go back, go home, you know. he. Myung returns home, never to see her father again. He will be killed by the Kim Il-sung regime. I, uh, I thought I got over a long time ago. While the communists tighten their grip on the South Korean capital, outside of Seoul, the desperate Rhee regime is rounding up and killing as many communists as possible. The South Korean secret police empty the jails of all suspects at a place called Su Wan. A massacre begins. Donald Nichols says his South Korean forces went a little too far. He uh, 
uh, unforgettable massacre of approximately 1800 at Suwon. Most atrocious I'd ever seen. And I stood by, helplessly witnessing the entire affair. You know, these uh, two big bulldozers worked constantly. One made the ditch type grave, and trucks loaded with the condemned arrived. Their hands were already tied behind them. They were hastily pushed into a line along the edge of the newly opened grave. An efficient group of personnel followed. Forty-five pistols could hardly miss the fatal headshots from two or three feet away from the ones who were still standing. When the second dozer pushed the dirt over the tumble of bodies in the mass grave, I tried to stop this from happening. However, I gave up when I saw it was useless. I was the only foreigner there. I believe they knew they were doing wrong and wanted no witnesses. Yeah, worst part about this whole affair. Not all the people killed were communists. In Washington, five days after the attack, Maria President Truman finally gives the go-ahead to dispatch away. U.S. forces but in a desperate attempt to staunch to the communist American. invasion. We are united in detesting communist slavery. We know that the cost of freedom is high, but we are determined to preserve our freedom no matter what the cost. But on that day, Truman also notes in his private diary, must be careful not to cause a general Asiatic war. Now the North Korean army is advancing almost without opposition down the Korean peninsula. The nearest US forces are MacArthur's occupation soldiers in Japan. South Koreans cannot resist the enemy's headlong rush south. I will throw my occupation forces into the breach. Completely outnumbered, I will rely upon strategic maneuver to overcome the great odds against me. It will be desperate, but it is my only chance. The U.S. occupation forces from Japan are not the best choice for desperate battle. They are green and young, most not yet 20 years old. Only one in six have ever seen combat. Now 540 members of the 21st Infantry Division find themselves in Korea, a place many have never heard of. Going with them into battle, was Philip Gigantis, then a foreign correspondent for the London Observer, later a member of Canada's Senate. A combat veteran of the Second World War, Gigantis was not impressed by the first days of the U.S. war effort. The American troops they had there were people who had not been trained even how to handle a rifle. They were young American kids who ran uh, army post office, PX, and that sort of stuff, and they're suddenly thrown in Korea. The North Koreans were cutting off American unit after American unit, and uh, this particular company I was with was cut off, and I had to intervene and say, hey guys, you don't light cigarettes, and you don't make a noise. Will you please? In effect, I took command of the company, and I brought it back to our lines. Before long, the ill-trained and ill-equipped troops are being outfought and outmaneuvered by the skilled North Korean advance. In the first three weeks of the war, I was filled with pity the sense of betrayal displayed by our young soldiers, who had so suddenly been plucked out of soft occupation life in Japan and plunged into battle. Oh, well, 
facing the rout of UN ground force, the United States turns with a vengeance. Flying along on the mission. First from the jet's arsenal come the machine gun. Americans back home hear about the air war from newsreels, which are unabashed propaganda. The Allies reach the Han River, inflicting a staggering total of 57,000 red casualties as death, here in the form of jelly gas napalm bombs, rain down from the Korean skies. But unlike the Second World War, there are also independent correspondents on the ground to describe the dark aspects of the air war especially the effect of jelly gasoline bombs, napalm, on the civilian population. Those who are not incinerated often die from instant suffocation, according to George Barrett of the New York Times. The inhabitants of the village and in the fields were caught and killed and kept in the exact posture they held before the napalm struck. A man getting on a bike. Fifty boys and girls playing in an orphanage. And a woman, strangely unmarked, holding in her hand a page torn from a Sears Roebuck catalog. There must have been 200 dead in that tiny hamlet. Some correspondents in Korea draw public attention to what seems to be the intentional targeting of civilians by the American forces. In July 1950, the U.S. Army is convinced that North Koreans are infiltrating their lines by hiding in refugee columns pouring out of the war zone. First, U.S. generals order all civilians to stay put, a highly unrealistic demand in the middle of a war. These recently declassified documents from the 25th Infantry Division show that American commanders are then ordered to take drastic action. Civilians moving within the combat zone are to be considered as enemy. U.S. Navy pilots are ordered to attack any group larger than eight people. Similar orders are given to the U.S. Air Force according to this Air Force memo from the 25th of July, 1950. The Army has requested that we strafe all civilian refugee parties that are noted approaching our positions. To date, we have complied with the Army request. Before long, there are reports of the wholesale slaughter of refugees and the destruction of entire villages from the air. These reports caused consternation back in the United States. The U.S. Defense Department, however, considers the issue merely a public relations problem. Washington sends this message to General MacArthur's headquarters on the 15th of August, 1950. From now on, when villages are destroyed, strongly recommend that targets be identified as military targets. From that moment on, after any Korean village is destroyed, it is to be retroactively declared a military target. In places like Malipo, the villagers are trapped. Ed Cook remembers his father's life and death decisions. Fleeing means the risk of being targeted by Americans shooting at anything that moves. Staying means facing a new regime bent on eliminating class enemies. Ed Cook's father, Sam Wan, secretary of a Malipo fisherman's co-op, decides to take his chances with the communists. But almost right away, he is seized. Around nine o'clock at night, they were bringing my father into the school classroom and beating him, and accused him of spying for police. And my father said, no, I didn't do anything like that. And they kept telling you did that. You just confess you did it. My father says, no, I didn't do anything like that. I want to be a...
my father kept telling them, I tell you, I didn't mean anything like that. And they were trying to get confession out of him. And they, they never got it. And they kept beating him. I heard him groaning. And the, The following morning, I went to see him. He was so stooped and a big gash on his head, bleed. So I took him some food. I think he ate at that time. That's the first real fearful experience I had. Late in the summer of 1950, during the long American retreat, Allied casualties begin to pile up. The correspondents are not spared. Suddenly we came under fire. I got four bullets in my thigh, one in my shoulder, and uh, one here, which is still there. Uh, and he jumped out of the jeep because bullets were still pouring at us and we got into a small farmhouse which was right there at the edge of the road and there we found American soldiers who had taken shelter in that and one of the soldiers had been hit in the head by a bullet and it was astonishing how long he took to die the, the entry hole was in the forehead and the back of his head was practically blown out but he took 40 minutes I, I timed it 40 minutes to die not far away correspondent Marguerite Higgins is with an American unit that finds itself trapped by North Koreans my teeth were chattering uncontrollably and I suddenly experienced the cold, awful certainty that there was no escape. My reactions were trite, as with most people who suddenly accept death as inevitable and imminent, I was simply filled with surprise that this was finally going to happen to me. And as my conviction grew, I became hard inside and comparatively calm. Miraculously, Marguerite Higgins escapes capture. Philip Gigantis is not so lucky. A bunch of couriers took us out in the open. Uh, I kept showing them my press card, which was in Korean and, uh, and English. But uh, they didn't seem to be impressed by that. I was wrong because they had phoned to their superiors that they had a Shimbun Giza, which meant a journalist. And the death of one American soldier killed in Korea leaves a vivid impression on Marguerite Higgins. They brought the body of Private Shadrick in and laid him carefully on the bare boards of the shack. His face was uncovered, and I noticed it still bore an expression of slight surprise. It's an expression I see often among the soldier dead. The prospect of death probably seemed as unreal to Private Shadrick as the entire war seems to me now. For a while, we thought they were going to kill us because it made us kneel face to the wall and we were naked and we had found American soldiers who had had their brains blown out. And it was obvious they had been kneeling near a 
near a building. But then uh, an officer came and uh, we were not shot. We were uh, sent on a march north to senior people on the Korean side. At his headquarters in Japan, MacArthur is facing a calamity. His army is being beaten on the battlefield. The general who won the war in the Pacific is being humiliated by the unrated North Korean army. On the 9th of July, only two weeks into the Korean War, MacArthur proposes using the atomic bomb to stop any help China or the Soviet Union might offer North Korea. I would cut them off in North Korea. The only passages leading from Manchuria and Vladivostok have many tunnels and bridges. I see here a unique use for the atomic bomb to strike a blocking blow. President Truman rejects MacArthur's request for atomic weapons. Truman wants to avoid World War III a cataclysmic battle of capitalism versus communism. <laughs> Philip Gigantis is now in a very bad situation. After a long, painful march north, he is beaten and thrown into prison. He faces interrogation by a North Korean officer accused of a capital crime. He insisted that I was a spy. I said, no, I was a journalist. And he said, so you came to report to your newspaper, and would you check with us whether we wanted you to report those things you would want to report? I said, no. Uh, a Western journalist doesn't do that. If there were things to report about what the South Koreans were doing, I'd report it without checking with them, and I wouldn't check with you. He said, well, that's a spy according to our regulation. Making the situation more dangerous for Gigantis is that although he is a journalist for the London Observer, he is also a spy. He has agreed to feed information to British intelligence. What's more, the communists are almost certain of it. Unknown to Gigantis, they have been tipped off by one of their own spies in British intelligence. The North Koreans step up the pressure. They want a confession. That time in naked to a chair, once for 17 days. And you're sitting in your own excreta. And uh, they they pour water in front of you. Your chair! 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 Making sure that your tongue, the tip of your tongue can't reach it. Your chair! Your chair! And they're screaming insults at you. No! 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 Day and night. For those 17 days. You kill me! Spy! The sort of torture that Philip Gigantis suffers is a widespread phenomenon in the Korean War, with both sides doing it. Working with the Korean allies, I had to maintain a certain air of detachment, even approval, as I watched them improve on an ancient ritual of Christendom. I'll never be able to forget the image of a man tied to a wooden cross, his arms outstretched, thin copper wire coiled around one finger of each hand, and it was connected to a hand crank field telephone. As soon as that sergeant began cranking, the victim began screaming all the answers we needed to know. There was a phenomenon. I would leave my body and I'd go to a corner of the ceiling and look down at that 
shitty creature there in the chair. And uh, what was being done was not being done to me. I wasn't there. Gigantus never does break down. He spends the rest of the war in captivity. He joins the ranks of thousands of Allied prisoners who are marched up the peninsula to the prison camps of North Korea. This is the situation on the Korean peninsula in September of 1950. The North Korean forces are driving south, destroying all opposition in their path. The US and South Korean armies have their backs to the sea, forming a defensive perimeter around the port of Pusan. In China, Mao and his general staff are concerned that the North Koreans are not able to finish off the Americans and their allies. They fear North Korea will soon be calling on China for help. Historian Bin Yu says this prompted an intense debate. Well, those generals actually, they, they, they didn't believe China would have a chance. They would, uh, you know, suffer a great casualty. And many believed that China should concentrate on domestic uh, economic recovery. Even the severest critics of General MacArthur acknowledge that he is a brilliant strategist. With UN forces confined to their tiny foothold around Pusan, MacArthur devises a bold new plan. He will make a surprise landing of a large American invasion force at the port of Incheon, near Seoul, to cut off the North Korean attackers. The general presents his plan with an air of theater and a sense of history. Surprise is the most vital element for success in war. The Marquis de Montcalm believed in 1759 that it was impossible for an invading force to scale the precipitous riverbanks south of the walled city of Quebec. General James Wolfe and a small armed band did come up the St. Lawrence and scale those heights. On the plains of Abraham, Wolfe scored a stunning victory. Like Montcalm, the North Koreans will regard an Inchon invasion as impossible. Like Wolf, I will take them by surprise. In the autumn of 1950, one of the largest amphibious forces in history is being assembled. MacArthur's enormous gamble to reverse the tide of war in Korea is being put into play. If it fails, a secret nuclear battle plan waits in the wings.